us rejoice and be glad in it. And let me begin by asking, how does your garden grow? Look at this garden. It's growing so well. Thank you to Ann Dunbar and John Durkovic for setting it up and motivating so many of you to bring in vegetables for our garden. Thank you for bringing those in and creating this great tapestry. There's still some time. There's still some kits out there and some opportunities in the next week or so to really fill in this tapestry. But speaking of gardens, our garden for the community on this corner out in the grass is growing as well. They've started to take care of the land. They've cleared it. Irrigation's been put in. They're still meeting and planning so that come next spring, we can launch, relaunch our community garden with goodies for all those in our community that are food insecure. They, they don't need committee help, but they could use some committee help, but more than that, they need folks to volunteer for large jobs and small jobs once they get going. And sort of to give us a taste of it, that's probably not the best word I want to use because I want to talk about composting. Next week, we've got a great picnic. I hope you all are here. I hope you at home might feel like coming out and sharing a picnic after worship where we're going to celebrate and hear about where we are with Ignite, look at celebrating Sanders' retirement, hear a great presentation on composting and how we from home can help with the garden even as it continues to grow and then also find out about where we are with our planting seeds in our garden on this corner from our hearts for our financial commitment for next year next year. Thank you to the leadership that have brought their commitments in today and all of you, I invite you to return your cards next Sunday. I also want to share with you that before the picnic, the night before, we've got another great silent movie, The General, that's going to be played in the Fellowship Hall that Saturday night. I hope you might come out for that. Today is communion and if you did not get your communion elements out in the narthex, raise your hand gently. The ushers are looking and they can bring you some, but uh, we'll celebrate in just a little bit. And at home, I hope you'll take a moment to get some elements in your kitchen and where you're celebrating to lift that up. Finally, after worship today, we've got another impromptu fellowship. Nancy Geffart and some helpers have set up a little fellowship out of the narthex. Stop by and get a couple of nibbles and, and share a good word with Lastly, there's two deaths that we want to lift up this week and be with the families. First, Bill Martin's mother died last weekend, Lillian Martin. We want to celebrate her life. The services will be next weekend. And here in our community, Mary Jean Gleason died Monday night after a car wreck about a month ago. And services will be next Saturday morning at 10 a.m. right here in the, thing, in the sanctuary. We keep both of those folks and their families in their prayers. Now let us continue. Prepare to worship the Lord.
Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord this beautiful communion Sunday. The Lord has given us the gift of another beautiful day. Let us call ourselves into worship. Please stand if you're able. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise with songs of praise. For our God is a great God, in whose hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our Maker. God judges all people impartially according to their deeds. Trusting in God's love in Jesus Christ, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Almighty God, our world is filled with corruption. Power disguises itself as truth. Convenience masquerades as goodness. Selfish pleasure imitates love. We confess to you, O God, that we have been caught in the web of the world's sin. By the power of the Holy Spirit, save us from these deceptions and free us for glad obedience, that we may see the joy of Jesus' resurrection and receive the promise of everlasting life. As we continue, let us continue in silent personal confession. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. Followers of Jesus, God has promised salvation to us, to our children, and to all who are near and far. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Let's take a moment for the young in our midst and the young at heart. You know, a couple weeks ago, you may remember, I, I spoke about food. I've been speaking about food for several weeks as we talk about gardens, gardens particularly of commitment and how we grow our garden both outside and the one in our hearts and our generosity. But we've been talking about how different things and different parts of the food make that up. And you may recall that I talked about a cheeseburger. Well, this week I needed another cheeseburger. You may know how that goes. So I, I got this during the week. Y'all know what this is? Yeah, that's right, it's a Happy Meal. Have any of you ever had a Happy Meal? Any of you out there had a Happy Meal or, or gotten one? What's your favorite part? Is it the cheeseburger or maybe the nuggets? Is it the fries or the apple chips? You know, for some, I bet it's the toy. Let's, let's look and see what toy is inside this one. Still in the packaging, I thought it'd be a great reveal to bring in this morning. All right. It's a little Marvel character. Yeah, and there's a plastic button that pushes, oh, the hand raises. That's pretty neat. But you know, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, with this little toy, I'm not so impressed. It's a little disappointing. It looks, you know, a little on the cheap side. I don't think it'll last too long, especially if I punch that button too much or put it on a low shelf where some of my younger friends come into my office and like to play with some of that stuff. So I guess you could say it won't keep me happy for very long. And I got to admit also, while I was pretty happy with the cheeseburger and the fries that were inside, and those were gone a couple of days ago when I got it, I knew they wouldn't last for today. But as good as they were, well, when they were gone, right, they were gone. I wasn't really satisfied. Frankly, I could have had another cheeseburger and fries, but, you know, Susan said, no, don't do that. But frankly, that's the thing about Happy Meals. They don't really last that long. They don't make you happy for a whole long time. However, did you know that the church has a Happy Meal? That's right, we do. In fact, we're going to share that Happy Meal in just a few minutes. This is what, for some of us, our Happy Meal looks like, right? We've got the symbols right there, but for right now, this is what our Happy Meal looks like. It's a bit of a wafer, or maybe at home, a piece of bread or a cracker, and a little bit of juice. You know, it's not much, but what it represents is really something. You see, the, the bread represents the body of Jesus. And that bit of juice represents his blood. And when we eat this happy meal, we're reminded that Jesus loved us so much that he died on the cross so that you and I could have eternal life with him in heaven. Now that's something to be happy about. So I have this little poem that I thought I'd share with you. It's called Jesus Happy Meal. The Happy Meal doesn't look like much, and it doesn't come with a toy. It may not fill my stomach, but it fills my heart with joy. Jesus showed his love for me when he died upon a rugged cross on a hill called Calvary. There is no way I can describe the gratitude I feel each and every time I share in Jesus' happy meal. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus, who loves us so. Thank you for the happy meal we share this day as a reminder 
of what Jesus has done for each of us. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, word made flesh, let us come to this word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas, our brash assumptions. Cast out our casual detachment. Confound our expectations. Clear the cobwebs from our ears. Penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can, we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Listen to the word of God. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And our second reading this morning is from Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter verses 28 through 31, and then the concluding part of that story, verse 33. A little background for this. Cleopas and a friend were followers of Jesus, you may remember. Now, it's late on Sunday, and they are confused. First, they'd heard and been a part of the despair of the crucifixion on Friday, and now on Sunday, they've heard about the resurrection. So they take a walk to try and sort things out. And on this walk, they're met by a stranger. They tell the stranger all of what puzzles them. So listen as Luke finishes their story. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. The word of the Lord. And once more, let us be united in prayer. Loving God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, find acceptance in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer, our strength and our refuge. Amen. At the time that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, it was customary in most of the communities around the world at that time to, to have different groups eating together, to dine together. There were clubs, civic organizations, trade guilds, funeral societies, and devotees of various gods before he was crucified. Jesus introduced a way of eating a meal together that was wholly different. What made Christian meals unique was the range of people that were included in the meal. 
Now, 2,000 years removed from Corinthians, we can miss the great drama of what this text speaks. In the early church, the Eucharist was a real meal, not a small bit of bread or wafer and a, a sip of juice. The ones that I spoke of a few moments ago, the ones you are holding or maybe have ready for just a few minutes from now. It was a full meal, a meal that nourished the body and the spirit. Early Christian life revolved around these shared meals. In doing so, forced the early Christians to wrestle with wealth, poverty, and social class. For example, Jews did not normally eat with Gentiles. The poor could not afford membership in clubs and societies that ate together. Christian table fellowship was an adventure in uncharted territory. Think about it. How do you serve a group of equals when the layout of your house is designed to accommodate only a dozen or so first-class diners reclining on couches in one room while the rest of the household stands off and sits in another room. Or when you serve supper, when your well-to-do guests are finished with the work day, two to three hours before those who are slaves are finished. Or what do you do if the wealthy folk eat all the beef stew before the poor, who come bearing a, a small handful of grain before they've even arrived. These are the challenges that Paul is telling the Corinthians must be addressed. Otherwise, the meal is not the Lord's Supper, for it violates the very heart of what Christ died for. In Luke's story, those two travelers are not just walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They're on a long walk from the despair of the crucifixion to resurrection hope. And the turning point of the story comes when Cleopas and his unnamed companion invite a stranger to share their supper. And when their guest, as we heard, takes the bread, blesses, breaks, and gives it, only then, as they break bread together, do they recognize the risen Christ. Jesus was not just remembered at this meal. He was newly present. God broke into Cleopas' home in some mysterious way beyond rational explanation. And whatever happened, it was enough to send two tired people back out onto the road to walk seven miles in the dark. Mysterium. That's the word for it. Mysterium. Mystery. It's the Greek word that describes their experience. Sacrament is the Latin word that the early Christians substituted. A sacrament makes the presence of God tangible in a way human beings, you and me, can grasp. Cleopas' story describes a personal encounter, but it's more than that. It's also the story of the early church which knew Christ primarily in two ways, through the interpretation of Scripture and through the breaking of bread at the meals they shared. These encounters with the risen Christ at communal meals transformed a few discouraged Christians, a few 
sad Galileans into a worldwide movement. Perhaps sharing a meal seems like a small thing in a world racked by hatred, despair, and violence. But maybe not. Maybe not if we believe in the power of the sacrament to change lives. The key question as we gather around this table is, are we open? Are we open to being changed by receiving this gift? The actor, Stanley Tucci, describes what can happen through a shared meal. After recovering from cancer, he reflected that food both grounded me and took me to other places. It comforted me and challenged me. It was part of the fabric that made up my creative self and my domestic self. It allowed me to express my love for the people I love and make connections with new people I might come to love. Italian on both sides, Tucci adores the food traditions that were handed down through generations of his family. And on one occasion, having made a meal for the cast and crew on a film set, Tucci wrote, Watching my guests enjoy the meal I'd made filled me with great familial pride. In those moments, it was clear to me that someday, when my parents are no longer alive, I will always be able to put their teachings and all the love they gave me into a bowl and present it to someone who will sadly never have had the good fortune of knowing them. But by eating that food, they will come to know them, even if just a little. For Tucci, this is the essence of the sacrament. As he writes, if you love someone, you just want to get them inside you. How many parents or grandparents hug and kiss their kids and say, I love you so much, I just want to eat you up. Love can and does enter through the mouth. Our faith tradition affirms that when people of Christ gather to share food and drink, to eat together, God is there and God is moving to transform us. May this affirmation be true for you today as each of us struggle to grasp the mystery of the bread and the cup. So eat that you may live. To God be the glory. Amen.
I invite you to respond with me in our invitation to the table. You have come from afar and have waited long and are weary. Let us share the same bread, come and sustain our sustain the same Then. Let us stand together. Let us share the same spirit, the same thoughts, that once again draw us together in friendship, unity, and peace. Friends, this is the table of our Lord. And our Lord invites all of those who would come to sit at this table. So let us continue our approach with the great prayer of thanksgiving as it continues in your bulletin. The Lord is here. Spirit, open your hearts. We open them to God, we love them. People of God, give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to offer thanks and praise. Let us pray. When you could have been stingy in those first days, imaginative God, you poured out all that was in your heart into the silence and emptiness of chaos. Rivers rushed to the seas, mountains stretched toward the skies, animals danced in clovered fields, life sprang forth in every corner of the universe. You crafted all this goodness and beauty for your children, created in your image, that they might enjoy your gifts forever. But the empty promises of temptation sounded better than the choruses of the birds. The glitter of sin and death blinded us to the abiding wonder of your gracious heart. Prophets came to remind us that you are indeed a God of blessing, that you opened yourself to us in love, hoping that we would come home. But when we continued to waste our inheritance in the far country of despair, you sent Jesus to come to us, bearing the ring of redemption to slip onto our fingers, 
the robe of forgiveness to wrap around our broken lives. When you could have hardened your heart toward us, you let yours be broken by the sacrifice of your only child upon the cross. When you could have demanded that we give back everything we had received from you, you sent your most precious self that we might be reconciled to you once and for all. We never have to wonder about your love for us, beneficent God, for your spirit is that gift that is poured out upon the bread of the cup every time we gather at your table. We taste the goodness and the life and the bread which is broken for us, that we might offer all that we have to mend the shattered lives of those around us. We drink the cup of compassion, and as it flows through the very depths of our souls, we dare not hold tight to our gifts, but as your good and faithful stewards, offer them back to you so that the hungry might be filled, the homeless might find shelter, the captive would be set free, the sick might be made well, and all creation rejoice in your blessings. So, united at table, and in the words your Son taught, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so it was, on that fateful night when he was betrayed, and our Lord sat at table with his disciples. After he had given thanks, he took the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And in the same manner, after they had supped, our Lord took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye all of it, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. Community of God, people of God, children of God, the gifts of God for you. Once more, let us be at prayer. Loving God, gathered at this table like countless tables around the world in houses of worship and houses of community, we give thanks that we have been nourished by bread and cup, that we have eaten of the meal together. Now may we go forth and love. In Christ we pray. Amen.
able, I invite you to stand for the benediction. As you go forth from the Lord's table to God's world, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and grant you his peace, his shalom. Thank you.